So welcome back to day number two of Plan Your Future campaign by POUP. And uh, this is under the action of POUP Initiative 1.0. And it's a very great evening in the India. And I'm sitting right here with this wonderful people and with me in this on this, on this meeting on this occasion. And as we know that we are going to talk a very serious topic today, uh, the day two conference will be on the climate change causes mental health problems like depression and anxiety and I, I have some masterminds with me today to speak on this topic and to just share their experiences their their logics and and, and all of their scientific factuations that will make this conference and this session actually validated so now uh, before starting it up i would just like to thank some of the people without whom this conference would have been possible our media partner the mutebreak.com our beverage partner drink z we will have our blog partner as steen hoods and we will have our advertisement partner as lomba updates from indonesia and we will also have our special partner the startup times magazine and we will have our most importantly the host the wopno talks so uh, i will be starting this whole conference up just before uh, that we will just have some kind of a small knock shock and that is something like that uh, in today's world we know that climate change is one of the burning issue as everybody states it as but i would like to state it in a different way that in today's world climate change is not a burning issue in today's world it has already been to a level where it's burning the earth it's not a burning issue it's, uh, itself so let's concentrate on this conference not just as a practical and a daily conference let's focus on this conference as a practical scenario in front of you that what is the actual form of climate change and what kind of dangerous situation is going to bring up in the next few years i i heard once uh, barack obama said that we are the first generation to feel the effect of climate change and we are also the last generation who can do something about it i think this is a really important thing that barack obama shared with us that this is really important that we are the first generation who is feeling the effects of the climate change and we will be the last generation who can do something about it with this coming to our next speaker she's a companion she's an activist working towards the green deal related uh, issues in brussels uh, belgium and she has also created uh, the green sea purge project and uh, she's an also coordinator of the fashion revolution in belgium and also launched the burning case podcast she is chloe uh, mikolak welcome ma'am and over to you hello can you hear me well i guess sure. so yeah okay um well thank you so much for the invitation i'm really really grateful and i'm really happy to be here um i'd like to thank the previous guests it was really inspiring i learned a lot and this means i'm actually going to have a shorter presentation because i think a lot of the things about um climate anxiety and climate depressions have already been said uh, and really well said so i guess i'll just focus on my personal story in case it might be interesting to someone um so i didn't grow up being interested in the environment i really didn't care i was really into um overconsumption i traveled a lot i ate a lot of meat but what i've always um been is an empathetic person i think that's how you say it in english a bit like ann just presented and so i remember when i started law school there was this big 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 controversy in europe about palm oil and how palm oil was destroying um countless acres of rainforest in southeast asia and the homes of millions of animals uh, but also the livelihoods of of a lot of um, farmers and so i remember seeing that and i remember being extremely moved and extremely upset by what i was seeing and it led me to quit law school and and study environmental management instead moving on a few years i got my first job as a consultancy company working on sustainability issues and the focus of our work was on deforestation but it's kind of like going around the loop and i ended up working on palm oil again <laughs> and most of the bulk of my work day was receiving really horrible news about how many acres of forest had burned that day um how many 
species had been found dead or burnt or, or in, in other um, terrible ways because of the burning of the forest or how many people were working under palm oil plantations without any human rights or had their passport confiscated. You know, all these really sad um, and, and terrible news. And I've always been very good at compartmentalizing. I, th I think those words so like kind of push my emotions down and not really address them. So for a while, I felt fine. And then I changed jobs and now I work in policy making, which is a whole <laughs> different thing. Um, and I work as an activist also on the side. And so my job is essentially to influence legislation, to influence people who do not want to change and try to bring to them the urgency of the situation, try to show them the urgency of the situation and then try to convince them to work. And it's a tedious work um, because essentially when you work in policy making, how does that work? It, you do one step forward, a million steps back. So whenever there is one good news, um, and you're very happy for one day, I can guarantee you that the next day you're going to have a bad news about something else because that's just the way our system works and that's just the way our policy making processes um, exist and that's just the way our policy makers have been for the past decade. So it is quite hard um, to stay optimistic but at the same time you kind of you, you are expected to stay optimistic, you, can, you are expected to stay hopeful um, when you work in policy making because otherwise you don't get anything changed. And it's the same with activism, you know, as an activist, I wouldn't say you're expected to, but you put that pressure on yourself. And when you mix both, when you mix policy making and activism together, it's not even others that are putting a lot of pressure on yourself, it's just yourself. You're like, the scale of the issue is so big you know, we're talking climate breakdown and some of the policies I'm working on could potentially be a game changer. Um, I'm talking trade policies um, with other regions of the world that could either lead to more deforestation or less deforestation. I'm talking about policies about plant obsolescence of our products that would otherwise end up in nature. So it all feels really daunting. And so as an activist and someone who works in policy, you have this tendency to put a lot of pressure on yourself and to be like, you have to do good on this because this has an impact, then you tend to forget that you're surrounded by other people. But because also climate anxiety and, and, and eco-anxiety in general wasn't really discussed or acknowledged for a really long time, I've kind of shoved it down and haven't really addressed it for a while. And then I remember it was probably two or three years ago, I was going to an event um, to talk about sustainable fashion and it was in the midst of the um, the fire crisis in South America and all these hectares and hectares of rainforest um, burning down to grow soybean and, and raise cattle um, and all those um, human rights abuse on indigenous communities that were essentially losing their home and all these awful news and all these emotions that I had been dismissing for a really long time I was I remember I was on a train going to that event and it all hit me at once so all these years of not acknowledging what I was feeling kind of hit me at once and I started like crying in the middle of the train and people were looking at me probably thinking oh Paul has just lost her job or she's going through a breakup if only they knew um no I wasn't I was just feeling so many mixed emotions and it was a, mi a mix of anger it was a mix of sadness of frustration um and just all the things that i hadn't really been acknowledging for years and i really of course didn't want to go to that event i ended up going and i'm really grateful i did because i was very transparent and i said this is not a really good day um i'll do the presentation but that's pretty much all i can give today and people were very and yeah, understandable. Um, but just to show you how this affects people who work in NGOs working on these issues, for instance. So um, in here in Brussels, the turnover and the rate of burnout of people who work in environmental and social NGOs, but mainly environmental, is huge. It's through the roof. And of course, they don't all say that it's because of climate anxiety or climate depression or, or whatever. There's plenty of other reasons. Um, but I can guarantee you that quite a few of them, this is one of the main reasons that they burn out at the end of the day. Once again, because of that horrible, daunting prospect of climate change, but also of the pressure that you put on yourself to try to 
have an impact on that. Um, and so, yeah, so for the past, this was about two or three years um, ago. And for the past two or three years, I have decided to acknowledge <laughs> that feeling of, of eco-anxiety and be vocal about it. And because I couldn't really turn to my colleagues at that point, once again, because of that silence um, about these issues, I turned to social media and I made a very honest and transparent post saying, I feel horrible today um, because of that reason, that reason, that reason. And I feel like we're essentially going to crash into a wall and there's nothing we can do because we've run by stupid politicians and that no matter the facts and no matter the arguments we present, they're never going to change. Um, and the response was really overwhelming. Um, I got a lot of responses from people who were feeling the same way and who couldn't necessarily open to their friends, families or colleagues about that. So they were just keeping it all in. Um, so that's going to bring me to, to a few tips, if you want to call them. I'm definitely not an expert on this issue, but I thought it'd be interesting to maybe share um, the things that I've learned. And the first one is you do you in terms of how you're dealing with that. Um, so some people are going to want to talk, going to want to express their feelings, they're going to cry, going to yell, they're going to do whatever. Um, and some people aren't at all. So I'm just thinking of my boyfriend, for instance, when he feels overwhelmed by um, climate change, by something very, very sad that we're seeing uh, on the news or wherever, he's not going to talk about it. He needs to digest this on his own. I'm on the contrary. I need to talk it out. I need to talk to someone. I need to express my anger. I need to say what a horrible world we live in, um, how people are super selfish. You know, I really need to essentially let it all out. And this is something that I've learned is that you can't expect everyone to react the same way. And so you need empathy, essentially. You need to understand that not everybody's going to react the same way and that's okay. And what I do now is I, I, I'm not going to force people to talk to me, for instance, about how they're feeling regarding climate change. I'm just going to let them have the conversation if they feel like it. Um, the second one is to rest, <coughs> sorry, rest as an act of resistance. And of course, this only is valid if you're privileged. <coughs> sorry if you're privileged enough to be able to rest, because if you're juggling um, two jobs and, and um, a family and, and a lot of different responsibilities, you might not have the time to rest. Um, so, and that's completely fine. Once again, it goes with the you do you kind of uh, mentality. But if you are able to rest, I would strongly suggest doing so because there's just, as Anne expressed, there's just so much we can do as individuals. You know, it's not about you as an individual changing the world it's you being part of a collective that is gonna have an impact and so if you are able to rest in a system that has consistently been telling us for decades that rest rest is for people who are weak that glorifies overworking that glorifies um working dozens and dozens of hours and and claiming and not claiming but saying that you're overworked and that you're overtired if you are able to rest that is probably one of the most impactful thing that you can do as well um and then as the previous speaker says said action definitely action for me doing stuff that were aligned with my values is one of the most important thing i could have done to address my climate in eco-anxiety um i think if i had kept well, I mean, I was working in, in the environmental movement already, but also aligning my personal values, what I was doing at home was really important. But then again, without putting too much pressure on you. Um, something that is quite interesting is probably that a lot of activists that I know, a lot of people who work in the environmental movement, they're not perfect um, eco people at home they're not perfect greenies they don't only buy zero waste they don't only eat local um they're not necessarily great at recycling or they still fly or or you know they do stuff that have an impact but it's because they focus so much also on, on changing the systems that they're not 
putting extra pressure on themselves to be perfect at home. And I think this is really important. Of course, if you can, and if you want to be perfect at home, that's perfectly fine. But don't put too much, an extra layer of pressure on yourself. If you're already feeling eco-anxiety, don't add an extra layer of anxiety um, to be completely perfect and fully aligned with your values. For me, I chose some battles. I chose some battles depending on the time that I had um, and the, the ability that I had to do certain stuff. But I'm definitely not nowhere near uh, perfect, whether it's at home or at work. Um, and then if you also have the privilege to be close to nature, that is definitely also one of the main tip um, that I would have is to immerse yourself in nature. And but yeah, definitely action. And as um, I think Anne said as well, it's so important to understand that you're not alone in this. And if you need to stay, to take a step back for your mental health, if you need to rest or if you need to not necessarily rest but just take a step back from activism because it's too much on your health or it's too much just on, on your everyday life um do that the movement is not gonna die off if you're not there anymore it's why it's called a movement it's because there are hundreds of thousands and millions of people actually around the world fighting for the same thing and we are only going to be able to do that if we all take care of our mental health take care of each other and if we're all here in the long run otherwise this is not going to work and we're essentially um, allowing the current system to prevail and to be successful in the end so i guess that's pretty much it on my side um don't have anything else to add <laughs> thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for inviting me today thank you chloe for this uh, wonderful words that you have shared with us and i think uh, this is really beneficial for all of us so for now uh, we are almost at the termination of the sessions and thanks to every single one who have joined this session with us thanks to our audience and most importantly all of our guest speakers to come over here and share their own personal experiences and giving us those valuable words which can really help our organization as well to really cope up with what is the present scenario of mental health getting affected by climate change thank you everyone have a nice day ahead